Thank you very much, Donald. It's a, it's a great pleasure for me today to visit with Michael Dowling. Michael's a legendary towering figure in healthcare. He's on top of everything else he's done, grown the Northwell system with a magnificent leadership team. He's also seen Northwell in New York State through the most difficult COVID period and held more COVID patients than any other system in the country. Mike, can you take one moment to introduce yourself and then we'll get started with some of the discussion. Yeah, um, I'm, my name is Mike Dowling, and I'm the president and CEO of Northwell Health, and uh, we are the largest uh, health system in New York. And uh, we have been through a pretty phenomenal experience over the past uh, three or four, six months. So uh, unusual and uh, unprecedented, to be sure. Well, certainly. And, and Michael, you're someone who's literally talked to the governor daily or weekly or very, very often about what the situation is. You handled more COVID patients than any other system in the country. Talk to us a little about what that experience was like in March and April and so forth. <clears throat> yeah, uh, this has been uh, absolutely uh, unreal, to be honest. Um, it started back at the beginning of March. And the worst time for us was the end of March and the first few weeks in April. Uh, that's when we had about 3,500 patients in our hospitals which really meant in practice that almost all of our facilities were completely COVID, 90% uh, COVID, 95% COVID. Patients were coming in um, large numbers each and every day, which meant, of course, that we had to react very, very quickly. We had to adapt very, very quickly. We had to create new beds overnight every day. Now, I will say that at Northwell, we were pretty well prepared. And one of the things that I can say is that is extraordinary to watch the courage and the compassion and the, de the dedication of the staff on the front lines. I was out on the front lines all the time. I was in every ICU, in every hospital. And when you're out there and you talk to staff and you watch what goes on and you see the environment and you understand the circumstance, what they were able to accomplish in the height of a crisis like this is absolutely um, humbling. And I think Anybody that is thinking about or entering the field of healthcare, uh, those people who did this great work are an inspiration. And for those who don't know healthcare, and I think they do appreciate it because the public showed a lot of gratitude during the crisis, but healthcare is a unique business. Uh, the people who work in healthcare are unbelievable, and we should take an awful lot of pride in what it is we do each and every day. And that was demonstrated more clearly during the COVID crisis here than anything else I've seen in my career. Uh, an unprecedented experience, but something that I think we have to learn from, uh, something that uh, got us to prove ourselves. And I do think at the end of the day, we will be better off because we went through this experience. But it was something that we've never been through before. No matter what you've gone through in healthcare, in your career, uh, nothing compares to what we experienced here uh, in March, April, and the beginning of May. So you, throughout this crisis, provided with your team incredible leadership, incredible inspiration, and I know you were inspired by a lot of the frontline people and everybody in the system working through this. Just remarkable leadership. Talk for a moment, Mike, about what things look like today. Is there a new normal? What does that new normal look like today? Well, there is a new normal today. And there will be a new, new normal tomorrow. Uh, today, for example, uh, what's going on right now is we have very few COVID patients in New York. We're doing a lot of testing. Most people are wearing masks. People are social distancing when they possibly can. And in, our, in the healthcare field, most of the business that we had pre-COVID is back. Our hospitals are full. Our ambulatory sites are full. Um, we are watching, however, and I, I would not say, say at this point that we have, uh, we're over the COVID crisis. We are obviously planning on the assumption that we will get an upsurge sometime in the next couple of months. That's pretty much inevitable. How big it is, we don't know. But the regular business is back now. The new normal is that even though the business is back, we have to operate differently. Uh, the surgeries that were deferred during the COVID crisis back in March and April, we had about 35,000 deferred surgeries. So we're catching up on that backlog 
as well as making sure that we take care of the new people that are coming in each and every day that need surgery now. But when they come in for surgery today, as this thing from in the past, we have to test everybody a couple of days before. We have to make sure that they're negative. If somebody comes back positive after a test, we can't do the surgery right away. We have to reschedule it another time. That adds a whole series of process and protocol that we didn't have before. When you visit the hospital today, you have to be screened on the way in. Visitors are allowed, but it's limited. The numbers that can come in to see every patient is limited. Um, for patients themselves, when anybody goes to the hospital, they're pre-screened. All employees are pre-screened when they come in. So it's, it's a different world, but it's what you have to do in a circumstance like this. So we're in a good place right now, relatively speaking, but we can't get overly confident. We can't get complacent because this can bounce back. Now we do have uh, a couple of locations in the region uh, communities in Brooklyn and Queens, for those people that know New York, where we are seeing in those communities a little uptick on the number of positive patients. And that's because in some communities, people are not complying with mask wearing. They're not complying fully with social distancing. So we are seeing in certain communities an uptick, and that's a little bit dangerous. Uh, our surveillance systems are monitoring this on a daily basis just to make sure that we can anticipate it uh, prevent it if possible, and then make sure it doesn't expand. And that's going on right now, focusing on all those communities, try to convince them and those groups and those organizations that they have to comply with mask wearing. Because the last thing we want to do is um, not have a dramatic upsurge. And the other thing that's impacted here is, of course, the economy. I keep saying to everybody that while the COVID issue from a medical point of view will be over at some point, Next year, the economic implications of COVID will last for a decade. Uh, the, you know, many businesses won't open again. Many businesses in New York are closed, obviously. Restaurants are only opening today for limited in, inside dining. There's been outside dining for a while, but no inside dining. Um, but many of the businesses will not reopen. Some of them may only open part-time. The hotel industry is only like 35% occupied at the moment in terms of rooms. So uh, the, the medical part of what we're talking about is one aspect of it. The economic part is, I think, a much bigger issue that will last much longer than when COVID is over, the economic implications will still be with us and we have to deal with that as well. And the economic implications at the personal level, at the state level, at the business level, will be there for a long time to come. Uh, for many, many states, cities, businesses, individuals, people. A brutal, challenging situation. Oh. Mike, we're going to talk a little bit about innovation, surgical backloads, and so forth. Just one moment, 30 seconds on surgical backloads. You 35,000 surgeries got held off on. How do you start to work through that backlog? Is there slowness in throughput right now? And, and, and how is that how is that pace of surgery today compared to pre-pandemic? Well, I, what I said earlier about all of the pre-testing is different today, but you, you know, when you have a big backlog, what you do is you prioritize the surgeries that you'd be doing. You know, we have a, a clinical advisory group. We prioritize the surgeries, those which must get done, those which can get done next week, or those can get done three weeks from now. That's one part of it. The other part of it is that we have extended hours. Uh, we do surgery now on the weekends, and I have been an advocate for a long time that hospitals are, should be open for procedures seven days a week. In a typical hospital, surgery-wise, for example, you do surgery five days, and then you're pretty close Saturday and Sunday. But now we're expanding hours during Saturday and during Sunday, and I think that that should, in, in, in part, become part of the new normal. We got to be operating round the clock pretty much seven days a week rather than confining ourselves only to five days a week, especially when it comes to procedure. So that's how we're dealing with this. Uh, it's not become a crisis here. Uh, our staff is very adaptable. Our surgeries, surgeons are very adaptable. And we're working through that backlog at the same time dealing with the current surgeries that are coming in. So it's just one of the things that you do when you get into a crisis like this. You just deal with it. You don't complain about it. You don't whine about it. You don't sit back and say, by the way, this is not possible. Uh, this is difficult. No, you just put your 
you know, your shoulder to the wheel and you deal with it. It's the, uh, you know, and, and healthcare is adaptable like this. This is what healthcare does all of the time. Uh, so we will deal Mike. with this successfully. And it's just not not well. It's also all of the other facilities in New York are doing the same thing. Well, certainly. In Northwell, it's not only one of the largest systems, it's the largest system in New York State. It's not only one of the largest, it's also one of the best and most innovative systems in the entire country. Talk for a moment about innovation, but also talk about early on, you got into the robotics surgery line. Talk about some of those decisions and how that ties into Northwell being one of the elite great systems in the country as well as large and, and the, the robotic surgery line and how you look at that. Okay, well, um, innovation is, is it's, it's, it's a way of thinking. Um, innovation is, is cultural. It's a, having a, a culture of thinking about things like asking yourself the question on an ongoing basis, what if? Uh, what if we did it differently? What should we look like a year from now, two years from now, three years from now? Um, how do we want to change? How do we challenge the status quo? Uh, how do we become inquisitive? How do we, you know, break some of the rules? To me, that's what innovation is about. Uh, you know, we, we, we unfortunately live in a world of compliance and regulation, which in my view is the antithesis of innovation. Because when you innovate, you've got to break some rules. You've got to break some habits. You've got to break some tradition. And we try to do this uh, at Northwell on an ongoing basis. I appreciate the compliment that you think we're one of the most innovative in the country. I'm, I'm hoping we are, and I think that we can always get a lot, lot more innovative. And when you get to robotic surgery, I mean, the question for us years ago was, how do we do surgery differently? How do we reduce the, 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 the volume of open surgery? Is there a better way? Uh, with all of the new technologies that are coming out, not just in this field, but in many fields, how do we maximize the use of technology? How do we use technology to get better, to improve quality, to standardize more? Use the data coming from the new technology to tell us how, do we, how we can predict better in the future for what should happen. Um, so we started back um, a couple of years ago with a major initiative to try to enhance the role of robotic surgery and robotics in general. I mean, healthcare has been pretty innovative in this over the years, I believe, because if you go into any hospital, you see new technologies all over the place. So we entered into an agreement uh, 2017 with Intuitive. Um, it's a wonderful organization, fantastic organization. In fact, we have a great relationship with them. And because of the learnings we got from them and because of the motivation by a lot of our own people internally, we began to dramatically expand the use of um, robotic surgery. We, are a, we were the first, I believe, the first in the United States to be declared a network of excellence in robotic surgery. So it's been a wonderful, wonderful advance. And I think we're only part way down the road here. I think what we can actually do together um, over the next number of years and the next decade is pretty extraordinary. I think it's even hard to imagine what we will be able to do in the future. So for, you know, robotics allows you, for example, to do surgery you would never be able to do open, uh, to be able to see things you can see uh, if you do them the old fashioned way. So you can cure things better with robotic surgery than you could do open. I actually um, have been in the operating room observing robotic surgery. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I spent seven hours uh, when somebody was doing th uh, thoracic surgery using robotics and sitting there, um, pretty extraordinary. I'm sitting there, I'm actually looking inside the person's body, watching what was being done. It would have been inconceivable to think that you could have done that if you didn't have the advances of, of, uh, of, of the technology that exists today. Uh, just a phenomenal, phenomenal um, experience and advance. And, uh, we are very fortunate to be working with a wonderful, wonderful company. Um, it's, it's been a real privilege and help, and it, it has helped us, and I think it has helped patients. It's a win-win for everybody. We'll take a moment, and, and we'll talk about Intuitive for a moment. Intuitive is sort of this remarkably talented organization 
was also great people really trying to add value to this sort of healthcare ecosystem. I mean, it's a really remarkable focus, remarkable training and effort to actually be great every day, magnificent firm. Talk a little bit about your work with Intuitive. Take a few more moments there. Yeah, we have a wonderful relationship. And you know, you can have many relationships with many companies, but you know what makes the difference? The technology makes the difference, of course. But what also makes a difference in these relationships are the people. If you can have a common interest, a common mission, common focus, and people have a real willingness to work together, and you enjoy working together, then you what there is no limit to what you can actually do. So we don't, have, we don't have a transaction with Intuitive. It's not a transaction relationship with Intuitive. It's a partnership. We partner with them. They partner with us. Um, we put together years ago uh, a, a senior leadership group to lead the effort around robotic surgery and to work with Intuitive. Uh, they have helped us in the training of the new surgeons, in, in figuring out how to, how to use all the data that emanates from it, how to standardize uh, how to do things we couldn't have done before, as I said earlier, uh, how to make sure we do things more efficiently, more productively, more, uh, um, more cost-effectively. So that relationship, which is a long-term relationship, is a partnership. Uh, and when you have companies like Intuitive that are willing to partner and make it a win-win, and you enjoy doing it together, then you, as you do it, you will... You know, my guess is with Intuitive that we will identify new things in the future that we should be working together with that we can't even imagine today. But that comes from a partnership mentality, common culture, common focus. It's a win for us. It's a win for Intuitive. Uh, and it's, of course, a win for the community and a win for the public. And it advances new ways of doing business. And it promotes research. It gets people to think in a unique way. So uh, we could not be happier with the relationship with Intuitive. It uh, has been fantastic. I have not had any complaints whatsoever. And as I said, I have been in the operating room myself observing uh, the advances that the relationship has brought to our, our organization and to the public in general. So it's been absolutely wonderful. And I compliment Intuitive uh, for what they've been allowed us to do with them. And uh, it's a win-win. Take, take a moment on this theme, Mike. I've talked to you before about this. Sometimes people from the technology world will criticize the healthcare world about their slowness in adopting technology. And I know you have a very different perspective. And part of the perspective grows out of the adoption and strength of working with Intuitive in the robotics line. You know, but, but more than that, talk about your perspective on healthcare technology and the use of technology by systems like Northwell Health. Well, I mean, there's been this criticism of healthcare, and I've talked about this before, about, well, healthcare is behind the times. Healthcare is not technologically focused. It doesn't use technology. It's kind of a mom and pop kind of business. And, you know, there's always a little bit truth to everything. But it is hard to say, to, to, to conclude that that's the proper assessment. If you go into any hospital uh, ICU or any hospital uh, uh, operating room, uh, what do you observe? Technology all over the place. We have been adapting technology for years and years and years. Of course, technology advances. Um, and so with, with robotic surgery, it's an advance. So I disagree that healthcare has been, you know, a laggard in technology. I don't I buy that. But I do think that we got to continue advance it, to, to advance it. And you advance it best by developing the relationship with companies that work with you in a collaborative, team-oriented fashion. So healthcare is very, very focused on the technology. Imagine uh, the things we can do with you know, treating heart disease today, things we can do about with stroke, uh, on and, uh, even orthopedic surgery, all based upon the advances of, of, uh, of technology. So yes, um, uh, I think that technology will carry us further and further on down the field. And, where healthcare might be a little bit behind is the connection with the consumer on the ambulatory side, the customer service part of the relationship with, with the patients and the customers using technology. I think we might be a little bit behind there, but when it comes to the procedure end, I think healthcare has been quite innovative 
and, and, and quite transformative. Uh, but having relationships with companies like Intuitive pushes the agenda forward. And that's the point I think that's really, really important to emphasize. Uh, we're, we're, you know, no matter how well we do with Intuitive, with Intuitive today, um, we will be doing better with Intuitive three years from now because we will learn more things that we can do together. And that's innovation, that's advance, that's transformation, that's moving the ball upfield. Well, and, and you have done a tremendous job of it at Northwell, tremendous job with Intuitive on it, uh, and, and great leadership. Two more questions I want to ask you today, Mike. We've got a few minutes left. I, I want to end with asking you about what you're most excited about today in healthcare. After, and, but I'll get there in a moment. First, I want to give you a moment or two on data and intuitive and Northwell's use of data to sort of get better and better and improve what you're doing in robotics. And then after that, I want to leave us a minute or two to talk about what you're most excited about today in healthcare and with Northwell and so forth. Mike? Okay. Well, on the data issue, obviously, we're, you know, I often define Northwell as an information company. Uh, you know, just imagine all the data we got. And so what we're working right now in a very deliberate fashion is how to, um, you know, how to use all the data, have put all the data in a single repository, et cetera, because the more data you've got, the more information you can use. Uh, the more it can help you predict what might be happening in the future with patients or groups of patients. It helps you monitor your quality, et cetera. And we're doing all of that with intuitive. Um, and I think that's exciting. Um, I have to be, I think we have to be careful also though that uh, it's the combination between the human and the technology that makes things work. So you go to, you've got to maximize the use of technology without losing the human factor in the delivery of healthcare, whether it's on the procedural end or on the diagnostic end. It's that balance, I think, that we have to be very careful to sustain going forward. We just can't go too far one way or too far the other way. Then I think we will not get the results that we all dream of getting. Uh, the most exciting thing going forward, I think we have a wonderful opportunity to transform our organizations uh, in part because of the learnings from COVID. So what do we learn from COVID? We learned a couple of things, and I could go on on this for a long time. We learned, for example, that various specialties and disciplines during COVID worked together in a more integrated fashion than they had ever worked previously. Now we talk about being integrated, but during COVID, everybody completely worked together, uh, especially in our organization. There were no silos. Cardiology worked with ICU. They worked with the thoracic people. Everybody came together. Now that integration, that sense of community of purpose is something that we've got to maintain going forward. Another thing, a transformation is the use of virtual care, telemedicine. We used it dramatically during COVID. That the genie is out of the bottle now with regard to telemedicine. We will be dramatically expanding that in the future. Um, how we expand out, uh, you know, post-acute care, home care, for example. How we expand ambulatory, um, ambulatory surgery outside the hospitals. Many of us are doing this. That, I believe, can be dramatically expanded in the future, and that's exciting. Also think that we've got to focus more and more in the future on wellness, on prevention. We have to focus an awful lot more in the future on dealing with the inequities, uh, very evident during COVID in healthcare delivery, because the minority populations, the African-American populations, the Hispanic populations were, more di were disproportionately affected by COVID. Um, we, we should be somewhat of ashamed of that. We should, we've got to address this issue. We've known about it, not been a surprise, but it's been dramatically exposed during COVID. Now the question is, how do we transform ourselves to deal with that going forward? So to me, I'm excited about the optimism. I'm excited now about the opportunity to, re to transform our organizations, not to go back, because I don't think we ever can, but now to use this opportunity, this unique circumstance, to rebuild, rethink our organizations going forward, how to be more productive, more effective, how to work with great companies like Intuitive, uh, and how to, to continually innovative, innovate. I think the public is demanding it. I think government will demand it. But more importantly, we should demand it of ourselves. 
That's what, to me, is exciting going forward. I think this is a great time to be in healthcare, in fact. Despite what went on with COVID, uh, it's a learning experience. It humbled us, and we've got to move forward now. One last question. You mentioned optimism. It's been a, it's been a very challenging time. You've led an organization through this with unparalleled grace and presence and centeredness. Are you, on a, on a one to 10 scale, are you optimistic about the future? Oh, I'm very optimistic about the future. I mean, I mean, I would put it down as a nine. Because if you're a leader, you have to be optimistic. What leader goes around and says, I'm a leader, but I am really pessimistic? Who's going to follow a leader who walks around being pessimistic all the time? Because the essence of leadership is to inspire, to be positive, to look at the possibilities, to say it can be done. Not that it's like, oh, my God, this is a terrible thing and we can't improve. Who's going to follow a person like that? Uh, if you're a leader, in my view, you've got to unify, you've got to take accountability, you've got to inspire, you've got to be positive, you've got to be upbeat. You've got to get up every morning and say, this is a fabulous day, imagine what I can do today. Go home at night and say, yeah, I did some good things today, but I can do better tomorrow. That's what's optimistic about this. Um, so when I look at the whole field of healthcare and I look at my own organization, you know, you know, raise the bar very high and, and a, you know, aim high and you'll get much further than you possibly can imagine. We can debate all of the problems around reimbursement issues and this is going wrong and that is going wrong. All of those we can take care of. It's the larger message we've got to give. During COVID, we became unbelievably essential. The public regarded us as saving their communities. They basically clapped in front of every hospital every night. They said, thank you, heroes. Now, they, we built trust during that period. Now let us live up to the expectation. That's the responsibility leadership have. Live up to the expectation. There is a lot demanded of us. We have to begin to deliver more than we have ever thought about delivering prior. That, to me, is what the essence of leadership is going forward. And that's being optimistic. Thank you, Michael. It's always a magnificent pleasure to deal with you, to visit with you, one of the great CEOs and great leaders in our country. Uh, a similar magnificent CEO is, is Gary, the CEO of Intuitive. Just a great privilege to visit with you today, to get a chance to visit with Gary recently. I want to thank Donald and your entire Intuitive team for having us. And let me turn it back to you, Donald. Thank you again, Michael, very much. Just always a pleasure.